The, the person I would like to mention in particular is Dr. Uma Chakrabarti. Uma has been with the Institute since its inception. She has not only come here every year for long stretches, but has stood by the Institute through all its ups and downs. To that extent, she has truly transcended her national identity and become a South Asian citizen. South Asia will never get out of its morass unless we are all able to do this. Unless, that is, we see ourselves as a region with common problems, common goals, and a common future. Unfortunately, India and Pakistan play an enormous role in not allowing such a solidarity to emerge. But uh, the, we, the people, can still work towards a region uh, in which no state or states uh, is dominant or hegemonistic, militarily, politically, economically, culturally, and ideologically. We can only do this by raising our voices and putting pressure on our respective states and our governments, but equally importantly, that we must look within ourselves and try to change ourselves. Uma has shown me that this is possible. Um, I'm going to uh, speak to you today. I mean, I'm basically a historian, as all of you know, and for years I've done this talk, which has always been on some aspect of history or the other. Um, I'm going to actually deal with a phase which is contemporary history in a sense. Um, it is a movement that um, has been active and is not yet dead um, in, uh, in Rajasthan. Um, it's uh, uh, it's uh, a movement of uh, Sathins. Um, and the reason why I think that this is a useful um, um, uh, lecture, I mean, this is useful for me to consider, is because uh, I think that um, uh, that the uh, there are certain kind, certain sort of um, commonalities that we have in terms of the of the fact that there has been a rapid um, investment in the idea of development all across South Asia, and in many parts of South Asia we also have uh, uh, we have uh, the emergence of development agencies. Uh, now this is um, uh, something that I think it's time for us to also think and evaluate. I take the single case of the Satins in Rajasthan uh, and I want to look at the kinds of contradictions that you can get into when um, the vision of the different partners in this, uh, uh, in this process is actually distinctive. So I think the question that I'd like to ask at the end of this is, um, it's, it's time for the women's movement to actually uh, do a kind of evaluation of where they are. I'm going to read today, partly because I have a, a bad tooth or a bad throat, I'm not sure which, uh, which uh, is really, uh, my students are telling me maybe it's cup because I've been, you know, sort of holding for two, three hours every morning. <laughs> but I don't think it's that, I think it's just an infection. I was, uh, basically, I'm also going to read it because I think that there are a lot of points in the detail and I want to be able to. Uh, cover them all. This paper is an attempt at examining the complex relationship between the women's movement, women's development agencies committed to the empowerment of women, empowerment within courts, and the state. Through a close examination of the working of a single program in Rajasthan, the women's development program, this is called the WD, DP, I'm going to use that acronym. I'm particularly concerned with exploring the contradictions as they emerge at two levels. One at the grassroots, and two, within the state development agencies themselves as major sponsors of the notion of empowerment. Through this, I hope to conceptually clarify the nature of the relationship between the women's movement and development agencies on the one hand and with the state ag agencies on the other. While the program I shall examine may be specific to a distinctive region, Rajasthan in India, the issues that arise from the working of the program and the larger context of women's development and women's empowerment is not region specific. Indeed, it has a bearing on the third world as a whole, especially in the context of the post Beijing uh, focus on empowerment. It's, it's now, you know, part of the, uh, the you know, so let's say it's, um, it's, it's a very important uh, term in, in the uh, development uh, circles. The WDP program was launched in 1984 in six dis districts of Rajasthan with assistance from the UNICEF. The immediate background was the recognition by the government in its sixth five-year plan, 8085, that there was a need for women's development 
and thus for the first time the Bhutan documented the, uh, uh, the for the first time the the um, uh, the Khan document included a chapter on women in development, while the Khan typically attributed the failure of development agencies, uh, sorry, objectives to the non-involvement of women. This is the classic thing they say, you know, that when you are looking down, they say it's respons the responsibility is cast on the women. Um, rather than the inadequacies of the government's plan strategies, it did indirectly concede that women's status was not satisfactory and that therefore women must be given access to development programs through innovative means. And this was the key thing, innovative means that they had to figure out. This was clearly an attempt uh, come to terms with the new focus of the, uh, on the abysmal conditions of women. This had been highlighted in 1975 in the famous Status of Women uh, report. The 1975 was this planned uh, with this big Status of Women Committee report, which has been actually a cathartic uh, report from the point of view of also the women's movement itself. So the WDHP in Rajasthan set its aims at creating a new sense of worth among the rural women and facilitating their awareness to develop strategies regarding social and development issues. Since the WDP accepted that development was not available to women due to lack of receiving mechanisms, as they put it, it intended to create, it, to create such mechanisms through what they call flexible and diversified structures. The WDP was not intended to take over the, uh, the uh, responsibility of implementing schemes, but to improve the participation, especially from disadvantaged committees, so the communities. So basically, they were supposed to be focusing on the most disadvantaged. Uh, now, within the framework of what was, where it's clear it's not a radical agenda, it's an ameliorative agenda. Uh, nevertheless, the uh, WDP did provide for a structure which was quite unusual. And the structure tried to link grassroots volunteerism with the security and stability of the government. So the idea was that you get in the grassroots and then you bring in the, uh, that is that the state provides the stability to the whole program. Um, and the third dimension, which was quite unusual, was to also link it up with a research body. This was the Indian uh, Development Institute in, in uh, Jaipur. So that you had research bodies which were also supposed to continuously monitor the, the working of this, uh, of this program. Now, uh, this decentralized process uh, was hinged, made to hinge on the village level worker. So what we tried to do was to identify a woman from the most disadvantaged community in a village and to then put her through a, pro a process of training. This process of training was, and, uh, was, uh, was to be uh, engaged in with three kinds of organizations, as I said. One was the district development body. The second was a, uh, was a voluntary organization, which was a development agency. And the third was this research institute, which was going to monitor the uh, relationship. The structure was an attempt to maintain a balance of power between the government and non-government se segments of the program. And this unique experiment was admittedly the end product of a series of reflections that had been carried out with women's groups. So there's an attempt to bring in women's groups. This is, you know, the uh, early 80s. So women's groups are very active and uh, the attempt was to bring women into this discussion, into the planning of this process. So the WDP permitted the initiative for decision making in conceiving the Southern model of women's development and it's working out in the field to be taken over by some women's organizations. So this is the first time that the state was actually willing to collaborate with, the women, with women's groups. Now, while the WTP could claim the participation of women, women's groups in conceiving and unfolding the project, it was not as if to say all women's groups uh, within the autonomous women's groups were actually willing to do this. Many of them considered that this was actually not going to be possible. And their argument was that the state is patriarchal. It is both a class state and a patriarchal state, and it really is not going to work. So some women's groups just stayed out of it and never uh, got into the process at all. But there were others very well-meaning, and I, I'm not, uh, in, in, as the story unfolds, um, it isn't a very uh, uh, pleasant story. But nevertheless, uh, I don't think that these women who became part of it at that point were trying to do anything except finding a way in which the state could be used in terms of its own emancipatory potential. So if the state has got an emancipatory, uh, emancipatory potential, then this is what they were trying to um, explore. Now, the agent of change 
uh, was was given the title of Satin. Satin is literally friend, um, and it was to be she was to be recruited. She was to be recruited uh, from, as I said, the most disadvantaged sections of the of the village, and she was to be instrumental in triggering off the growth of that is to explore women's collective strength and women's bargaining capacity and to help them articulate themselves as a collective group. So this is what the Satin was meant to do. Barriers of inequality, invisibility and powerlessness were to be broken and a base provided for participatory development. So this is what is stated as the, uh, as the thing goes into action. But the effectiveness of the Satin was predicated upon a transformation within the Satin herself so that she could become, through this process, a woman leader. So the whole point was to generate her, create a woman leader out of her. Uh, there was, uh, mechanisms were also decided, uh, were devised where village level meetings would be held. These village level meetings would identify the issues that people in the village wanted to take. And then that is what the Satin was supposed to link up with the uh, district level bodies so that finally there would be a number of people engaged in this transformation process. So now, as these women um, were, tra were trained, uh, and, and this training process itself is a very important one because in the training process, women's groups who actually are very serious about their understanding of you know, the need to, uh, uh, for um, women to feel confident used very creative strategies to try and um, create this uh, new leader within this you know, otherwise disprivileged woman. And uh, the process worked quite effectively in the early years. Um, women uh, would hold these meetings, they were called jajams, and at these meetings they would identify issues that were taking place that, that needed addressal in the village itself. And they found a whole uh, um, uh, host of issues that they could pick up. Uh, spontaneous struggles, therefore, began to take place around resisting patriarchal power, economic oppression, and the basic need for all men and women for minimum wages, recovery of land for encroachers, uh, and securing very often the widow's share of the land because this was often never given to her. So um, similarly, employment opportunities, safe drinking water, I mean they were just taking on issues as the village itself decided which the issue uh, should be. Now, uh, one of the early um, uh, uh, issues that were taken up was a case of, uh, of rape. And this was interesting. How did these women take this on? How's the, uh, how was it sort of treated as distinctive? Now, you, uh, you, you may be all familiar, perhaps, I, I think Pakistan also is likely to have uh, sort of village level leadership, which is some kind of a panchayat or some kind of statute, some kind of a body where hereditary rights exist. They were often, in, in, in uh, Rajasthan, they're often caste panchayats. Uh, and these are bodies which normally would decide issues that have come up in the village. The tendency always is to diffuse the issue, especially if it's a woman's issue. And so in one of these early testing cases, there was a, a rape of uh, a woman that took place. And typically the body, the statutory body tried to diffuse it by saying, find the man. Now, the women uh, who were by now sort of uh, now certainly seeing themselves as very, uh, you know, having a different understanding of the way in which you should deal with this issue, said that they wanted instead to file a criminal case. So they didn't think that that justice of simply finding the individual was going to uh, be satisfactory as far as they were concerned. So, and they succeeded in doing this, but they could do this only because they had this three tier, th three levels of uh, support for themselves. Um, similarly, for instance, in another village where um, uh, the issue was where is, is the drinking water, where are the wells to be located, um, they, it, it, they came to the conclusion that one, two tube uh, hand pumps were to be installed. One, they decided, must be in the Dalit Basti, in the Basti where uh, land, where, uh, you know, the Dalits normally don't have access to drinking water. So that is, now this immediately set up a contradiction in the village because the upper class, you know, tried to resist. Uh, this, but again, they were able to carry this through, even though there was violence in the process. So essentially, the uh, possibility that that is, as long as the three three tiers worked together, as long as the support was available through the development agencies and to an extent from the district uh, bodies, they were able to actually execute some of their 
fairly radical, uh, or fa at least uh, they were able to participate in what would be termed as a conflict within the village. Unfortunately, however, this early phase uh, did not last. Uh, partly, I think the district agencies, the, the support, as I said, of the district agencies was crucial, and an inherent contradiction in the entire edifice began to surface. There is a contradiction in this. Put simply, is it possible to have power from below if you have authority from above? Further, government agencies could not suddenly disempower themselves to empower vulnerable women normally at the receiving end of their power. They are in the habit of just, you know, dictating things to you. Fairly early on, the working of the program, one of the issues the Satin had to take up was the linking of famine relief uh, to family planning targets in the, um, in the area. Now, this was never actually written up, but uh, the subculture, the subtext was that only those women were employed in the family planning relief programs, the poorest who need it, only if they accepted also the, uh, the sterilization. So uh, now the women, these uh, uh, satins, who had actually had long workshops in which they talked about themselves and their disempowerment and the way patriarchies work and had all the time been told that the patriarchies are operating basically in your own areas, suddenly found the state itself to be as patriarchal as anybody else because their bodies were subject to control by the state, not just the, uh, not just the, uh, their kinfolk. So it's in this context that the, uh, uh, the um, uh, contradiction first uh, manifested itself. Now, while women were made targets of the sterilization program, the government agencies, which could fulfill targets, were actually told that they could have free global tours if they had a certain number of sterilizations performed. I mean, this is the crudest form of initiative that you can give to people, but that's what actually um, uh, was, uh, yeah? So uh, that, that's what was actually done. So their leadership, they were to be rewarded for their extraordinary leadership quality by just giving them these global tours. Now, one of the things that worked in favor of the Satin mobilization against this kind of uh, linking up of family planning with the uh, family relief was the fact that the Satins published a newspaper of their own, a little newspaper, which was called Kadrat, Satin Rokagat. That is, it was the paper of the Satins. And they used to collect their information and then publish this and circulate it around amongst themselves. Many of the Satins were illiterate, but they would have dread. And this was a means by which they kept track of what was going on in different villages. So they knew that it was illegal to link them together, but it was actually happening because there's this silent way. I mean, the, the, uh, the government is not likely to actually tell you what it's doing, but it links it in other ways. So it's this uh, thing that first, for the first time, set up the contradiction. Now, really, this is a contradiction in which the development agency which was involved in the district level should have been on the side of the satins. They should have actually been supportive of the satins. Unfortunately, the contradiction in the whole scheme became evident when these women, when, when the development agency at the level of the district uh, let them down. And they decided that it was, you know, they started arguing that, uh, that uh, you should not actually take uh, you, you, that, that is basically this was a government program, it has to be executed and you can't, you know, take a stand against it. Uh, now, uh, the, so basic, and, and, and even suggested that the logic of being, having a feminist position was to not get into a controversy. So the argument was just stay out of the controversy, let the state and the satins figure it out for themselves and we don't take a stand. Now that is an extraordinarily um, uh, unique and uh, completely, uh, what would you call it, unacceptable um, definition of a feminist standpoint because a feminist standpoint should have been supportive of these women. So essentially then the um, uh, issue led to a, the beginnings of a confrontation between the Satins on the one hand and the development agencies implicitly and then of course with the state. Uh, you'll find that, for instance, if the women did not participate in this linking up of this program, then they lost their honorariums for two months. Um, and it is interesting that earlier on, uh, the issues that women had thought that they would like to take up, I mean, after long workshops, they identified that there were two issues that were very crucial to women. One of these was regarded as the issue of land. They identified that. And the second, they said, was health. Now, it's interesting that they decided the issue of land was too political. 
So they dropped it. They didn't actually take it up and they took health in its place. Of course, on hindsight, we can say that there's no issue which is not political and health is as political an issue as land is. And that's what uh, began to unfold as far as the, um, as far as the uh, uh, program itself is concerned. <coughs> now, what, what, what is the attitude that you get as this contradiction um, uh, emerges? Uh, essentially, the, the Sathans were accused of working against the national interests. So you can see that the national interest is always brought in in a variety of ways, and that's what. And base and and you know the the uh, uh, so um, this is the first kind of betrayal that the Sathans uh, suffer. Now soon afterwards, uh, during this period, the Sathans also decided that they wanted to have a support of their own. So they set up a union of their own. Now this again came out of those training workshops where it was always said that women should be. Collective, they should form collectives and they should form community, you know, groups of themselves because you had greater strength if you were in a collective. So the Sathans had set up a uh, Mahila Samu. And uh, one of the things that they then uh, tried to um, uh, take up as, as a collective was again the issue of uh, wages. Now it was very interesting that it started off with this, uh, 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 with, um, with a kind of um, a paradox. The Sathans were getting a honorarium of 200 rupees a month. It was an honorarium. And uh, they went off to mobilize in one of their uh, campaigns when they went off to mobilize men folk and women folk in the village for minimum wages. The men turned around and laughed at them and said, what are you talking about minimum wages? You guys are working for, uh, you women are working for, uh, you know, so to, uh, this pittance of 200 rupees. So these women realized that, you know, what is being passed off as a sort of fine distinction, I mean that it's an honorarium, it's not a wage, is something that they uh, began to understand and they argued that, you know, suddenly they, took, they did a spontaneous strike. Uh, they said, they took over the mic in a, mic in a common uh, mela uh, where they set up a real uh, panic amongst the district development agencies because they took over the mic and they said 200 rupees is too low, we just have to have uh, better wages. Now, uh, the mela was quickly declared to be closed um, and uh, you know so this is this is the other way in which now they kept on arguing and saying that they want to be made government workers because they were doing work which was development work so if they were development they were doing development work they should be also called government uh, they should actually be called government workers and they was refusing this distinction between autonomous and voluntary work you know which people uh, which they were told was actually in their, uh, in their, um, uh, that is what they were expected to be doing. So they say, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, as the discussion in between the development agencies and these women is proceeding, they were told in daily that the, these uh, development agencies tried to tell them that, look, you're going too far. You've taken, you know, sort of you've, you're raising issues which were not on the original agenda. And they tried to make a fine distinction between wage labor and an honorarium. So look at the way they define it. In daily wage labor, the work is defined by someone else. The relationship is one of master and servant. The amount of wages paid is related to the number of hours worked. There are similar constraints in the concept of salary also. Okay. Uh, here too, there is a relationship of master and servant. Work is defined by someone else. Honorarium is not a payment for work. Here we decide on the kind of work we want to do. So there's this collective thing that they try and create. There is no restriction on time of work and there is no pressure from others. Here we have a relationship of equality. Because of these reasons, we must not discuss wage labor or salaries, but should discuss only honorarium. And this was a way to say, continue to work for these, uh, this pittance of 200 rupees. So essentially then, the uh, this burden this example of equality, it's a really extraordinary example of equality, uh, which in which the less economically cushioned women who are recruited from the bottom levels are asked to have a notion of equality with women who are you know, much better off and a part of these development agencies. So, and the girls, turned, the women turned around very interestingly and said, uh, the paradox was captured by them. So during the training, we were taught that women's work has no recognition. And those very people who taught us that they are not recognizing our work are now saying we are not doing work. 
So you see, so there's this, this business of the domestic labor debate and whatever which has been put across to them and which they've got in their own terms. They're turning around and saying, look, these women taught us this and today they're saying, this is not work, this is, uh, this is a really, this is voluntary, this is a relationship of equality, this is, um, uh, you know, this, therefore it is an honorarium. Okay, now some of these women, the next crisis was a, a, a group of these women went off to the Women's Activist Conference in Calicut. Now there's every two years, there's a conference like this in which activists go and uh, the, the union, the Mahila, uh, the, uh, the women's union went off, the Southern Union went off and participated in this and everybody who was, I was not at this, uh, uh, at this um, uh, conference, but everybody recalls the Satins and the fantastic presence of these women over there had most creative ventures, uh, you know, uh, participation, they sang, they danced, you know, they were extremely political and everybody remembers them. When they came back, they found that they were going to be subjected now to the power of the, the district authorities. They were, said, they were asked, why did you form a union? Why did you go to this place? And three of these women were dismissed for actually leading the move. So, uh, so you find then that the whole, you know, the facade of this equality, the facade of development, the, facade, the, uh, the rhetoric of empowerment actually doesn't hold when it actually passes down. I mean, if it's real empowerment, you can't, the, uh, the, uh, the district agencies don't take it. What is interesting is that they said that these women were splitting the movement, the Satin movement, but the dismissals were not regarded as, you know, anything that was, was going to disrupt the harmony. So essentially then, you, the women began to realize that the understanding of empowerment was instrumental rather than real. It's basically a rhetorical uh, ploy used to say, you know, we are empowering you. Uh, and, and, and in the ultimate example of this, some of these women who were meeting regularly and going for demonstrations, and in fact the Satins in, in uh, Rajasthan are uh, amazing because they go for every other kind of demonstration also, not only about uh, quote unquote women's issues, but they have the right to information campaigns, these women are there, they're there in every single movement over there. So they're very visible. Now, the husbands of the Satins got letters from the district agency saying, if you send them out without your permission, don't let them go out without your permission, if, they, if you do, then you will have to bear the consequences. Now you look at this classic situation, here is a, so in Ajmer district, uh, you know, perceived as the hotbed of the Satin activity, the husbands of the Satins received letters from the WDP instructing them to allow, within quotes, the Satins to leave their homes only if they received a letter with the WDP official seal. So they must go only to the WDP meeting and nowhere else. So they're putting them basically within a sort of, you know, another kind of restriction. Failing which the WDP would not be responsible if anything were to happen to them. So here you have a patriarchal state falling back on coercion and intimidation and the natural authority of the husband, where other major measures failed to. So there's, there's no problem in the state making an alliance with the husbands in order to police the, these women. So make them fall in line. So, uh, now, many of these contradictions actually were uh, most dramatically brought out in the case of Bhavari. Bhavari was a village of Satin who uh, was actually asked to execute a program. Now, one of the consequences of all these contradictions was that increasingly the, gov the uh, policies began to be uh, filtered from top down. They, they stopped the jajams, they stopped the meetings that used to take place at the grassroots level, and instead it was sought to make the Satins functionaries in the government program. So basically, you know, it, it, the uh, you got your orders from above and a policy would be set in motion. So one of the campaigns that Rajasthan decided to take up was against child marriage. Now child marriage is a, a practice, a widespread practice among certain castes in, uh, in um, uh, Rajasthan. Two-year-olds, three-year-olds are married. Uh, and uh, so the government decided that they wanted a campaign against this. Bhavari was asked to, like all other Satins, to also keep track of Possible marriages, these, these would take place but, uh, during a particular season. There's a particular uh, month in which these uh, marriages would take place. And she found that the, uh, a prominent Gujar of her village, uh, she was a Kumharan, so she was a potter, she was lower down, much lower down in the caste system. This Gujar 
in this household there was going to be a marriage. And so she, you know, so she first tried to persuade them. They said no. So then she went back and she communicated with her district level authorities. And finally the district level authorities came, tried to intervene. The marriage was performed secretly anyway. But Bhavari had to pay the price for actually focusing on this at all. And finally, in, in an active reprisal, the Gujars in that village, the prominent men in the village, gang raped uh, uh, Bhavari. Now, Bhavari was performing a function who were, which was a government, you know, policy. She, you know, so there was all this ambivalence now that was set up. Is she a government officer? She's not, you know, but she's performing this. So there's this way in which she was given 10,000 rupees or whatever it is as compensation. But on the whole, the machinery, the state machinery was not at all sympathetic in her taking. It is, again, the women's groups that came to her, came to uh, support her. And when the case was finally lodged, the women showed their solidarity because 180 sittings and hearings took place and the women's groups went for every single one of them. Unfortunately, the justice system being what it is, uh, Bhavari did not get justice. They upheld the charge of assault, but not physical assault, but not of sexual assault. And basically they said, you know, they con constructed this romanticized notion of the community. How can a community, you know, do this to one of their own bahus? It's not possible. And the judge simply threw the case out. The matter is in the High Court. It remains an issue, you know, which is which shows you uh, not only the contradictions in the system, but that you know, 20 years down the line after the women's movement, uh, something like this is is still one in which the the, the police, the state authorities, are really uh, uh, difficult to break into. Now, the Bhavri case, which was has been fairly well covered, and people know about this, should not let us, you know, not lull us into forgetting the everyday struggles that the Satyans were performing, which they continue to do. Uh, and so Bhavri herself, you know, said in, an in, in, in a nice way in which she inverts the logic and the, and the statement of the development agency, she said, and the, and the, and the district authorities, she said, Sarkar ne hi to sikhaya tha ki chup reh kar ke anyay mat saho. So I am now doing, that's what I'm doing. So you have this, you know, rhetoric turned turn, turn around. Uh, but the Southerns who, you know, and, this, and these contradictions as they emerge have not actually been one in which the advantage has been with the Southerns. Part of the a, a fundamental uh, reason why this has been a letdown has been because the development agencies themselves have not supported the Southern struggle and they have been quite complicit in allowing this program to be completely revised. So now it has become a program. The Southerns are being appointed. Whoever is left is left. Their wages remain 200 rupees. Their honorarium remains 200 rupees. And in its place they have set in what is a totally different kind of program in which they are simply to execute government orders. So they have now become, as they themselves put it, they run crashes, they do dalia distribution, but that's it. There's no longer any way in which they can actually go and mobilize uh, the village women in the issues that are important to them. So there is therefore uh, uh, a totally different, uh, you know, uh, paradigm that's been set in motion. Ironically, what is interesting is that the government, when it goes to every international forum, Vienna, Beijing, wherever, they're always proclaiming the Satin program as their great success. So there's this completely ironical situation in which they've killed it at the bottom, but at all the international fora, they go along and do this. And in its place, they say, we will now set up collectives. And in the collective, the Gujarin and the, Chama and the Chamarin and the Kumarin are all put in the same despite the fact that the class interests of these people could be very distinctive. So it's very difficult for them to actually identify issue that they can take up, which is both class and gender at the same time. So, uh, so essentially then, uh, it's the, the whole program has been completely um, uh, transformed beyond recognition in, if you compare it with the, old, uh, 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 with the old model that they operated. And, and it's sort of, uh, uh, and, and many women who were participating in the struggle and who felt very angry with it, they said, what is it that the WDP then was intending to do? Using the progressive language, symbols and idioms of various movements, 
The WTP is an attempt to implement government programs under a progressive car. Now, of course, if you all remember, and those of you who are old enough to have done that, during the emergency, one of the big reactions to the government had been the forced sterilization program. So it was clear to the government that they could not do that any longer. You can't have that kind of forced program. So you need to now come in at a different level. And all the women began to feel that they had just been used in order to push ahead the program that the government decided was important for them. This is not something that's, uh, uh, it, it, doesn't, it, it isn't something that doesn't have its own um, uh, other fora. The literacy program, the, the, the adult literacy program, similarly, was less set in motion. When it became really radical and, you know, uh, when it took off uh, in the anti arak they, they, the women decided that they were going to take an anti liquor campaign. When that happened, you, they pushed the government. In many places, they did succeed. But in many other places, they transformed the literacy program itself or wound it up because they found that it was setting up too many contradictions. So essentially, you'll find that you know uh, it, we have to hold the uh, the programs that they are unleashing because it can have unintended consequences which they are not prepared for. This, I think, the tragedy in all of this is that it has split and confused women down the line, and that's the question that I think that we need to think about. As one woman put it to uh, one of her development uh, uh, development. Um, uh, agency, women in the WDP, she said to her, this uh, one of the Satan said, Benji, when you talk of equality, are you talking of equality with my husband, who is a dangerous laborer? Or of equality with my landlord, who owns 60 acres? Or of equality with you, who earns about 50 times my wages? So what do we have in mind when we talk about equality? So you go up into the field, you talk about equality, you say you're breaking down all these barriers. Yeah. And in reality, actually, nobody is ready to you know, take the consequences of that, uh, that uh, uh, energy that is unleashed when women become part of this. So a uh, question that we need to, I think, collectively address is, can a patriarchal, patriarchal and class-based state actually empower women? What does it want to empower them for? We have to understand their understanding of empowerment. Should women activists be part of the proce process that begins something, but which they themselves find that they cannot see through because it goes out of their hands? And most importantly, when these contradictions come up, and that tragically did not happen in the, in the case of the Satins, when they find that it, it actually is not doing what it set out to do, shouldn't these women then distance themselves from the program itself and say, look, you know, we thought we could do something, it hasn't worked, but we should now, we should actually publicly disassociate themselves from this move. And I unfortunately uh, feel that not enough of this was actually done. So it's in this context that I think that it's important now for us to see what do we understand by the term empowerment? Uh, what do we mean by it? What do we want it to achieve? And should the, and I think this is a question that needs to be put now, not development agencies have their own agenda. I think it's a question that we need to put to the women's movement. You see, what is it that you think you're going to achieve through all of this? And I think that's the, that's the moment that we have now come to. The good thing is, the bad thing is that the Satan movement is now part of other struggles. Its own struggle is something that has, its own program has been so totally transformed. But it's also clear that through these struggles, through the Satins, who do, as I said, you know, participate in every other struggle, that the Satins have shown that they are actually empowered. That's, that's the thing. That is, they, they understood what empowerment meant. They understood that this is how it should be translated. And they understood that, you know, they even questioned this question, why can't we be part of the government? You know, yeah. it's a question. Of course, ridiculously, the government turned around when it was, this was posed to them. The government turned around and said, they're uneducated. So you can't make them government workers. How do you like that? Huh? So the government keeps you uneducated for 50 years, doesn't give you any means of literacy. When they turn around and say, this is it, then they say, well, we can't take you, become, make you part of the government because you're, you're illiterate. So you have this, you know, it's a, it's a case of the government, uh, you know, not recognizing its own total failure in giving... Two women, what was their due? Uh, and, and women should be getting their education. 
in and of itself, not as part of literacy, not as part of uh, family planning programs, not because today everywhere in South Asia they're linking literacy with declining fertility. Okay, all right. But we, that's not the reason why women should be educated. Women should be educated for themselves for, because they have a right to knowledge. They have a right to understand social relations. So really that's what has to be. So today I think the question that does arise is, how does the women's movement now look at this whole experience of, you know, setting something in motion, failing, it failing to take off? I think it's time for them to stop and take stock and say, how do we understand development? Is the women's movement interested in development per se? And I can see that there's a, it's an important thing. I mean, I would like women to be able to increase their bargaining power, increase their food security. I would like them to do all that. But that's not the only goal that the women's movement is interested in. The women's movement is also interested and fundamentally interested in the end of patriarchy. Is, are these programs doing that? And if they're not, then I think we need to think about them.